Welcome to the Pharma Forum podcast. In this latest installment, I welcome as guest Carl Hansen, CEO of Absella, for a thorough discussion of antibody therapeutics, from their first development to their use today and how they are working to bring clear value to patients. Although at times drawing a distinction between the biological side of matters and the technological, it is, however, a matter of combining the two that facilitates a path forwards, Hansen explains. And so, we discuss the difference between these therapeutics and the likes of small molecules and cell therapies, for example, touching also upon the state of the biotech investment landscape in recent times. It is a conversation that appraises the evolution of antibodies and retains its belief and commitment to their development in and for the future, for the benefit of patients. I hope you find the discussion as interesting as I did. And as ever, thank you for listening. This is web editor Nicole Raleigh, and today I have with me Carl Hansen, CEO of Abcellar, a company which grew out of the idea that single cell microfluidics and next generation technologies can radically change how drugs are discovered. Welcome, Carl. Thanks, Nicole. It's great to be here. So, in this episode, we'll be discussing the discovery and acceleration of antibody therapeutics. But before we get into that, Carl, perhaps you could tell listeners a little more about your personal journey to what you do today and the passion that propelled you along that path. Uh, sure, happy to start there. So maybe maybe to start that my uh, my formal you know training and education was not in the biological sciences. I started my uh, post uh, high school education focused on math and physics and engineering. Uh, so I did an undergrad, you know, getting versed in uh, equations and quantum mechanics uh, and a lot of work on technology. And post that, I uh, decided that I wanted to pursue a career in science and technology and, you know, had the, uh, the intuition, which proved correct, that at that time, and that was about 2000, that some of the biggest opportunities were going to be in the life sciences. So I pursued my grad studies at Caltech and was able to uh, be part of a terrific and innovative group that was focused on developing technologies to make it easier and faster, uh, and in the best cases, uh, to fundamentally enable uh, research in basic and applied biomedical research. And from that, um, you know, got into the world of microfluidics and single cell analysis, and probably more importantly, you know, starting in 2000, was able to maneuver myself in, as a technology developer uh, and get, got a chance to work with some terrific scientists in life science. And so biosmosis uh, picked up more and more of the biology and uh, medical research side of things. Following that, I then went uh, to pursue an academic career at the University of British Columbia. So I was a professor uh, in Vancouver, Canada uh, for about 10 years, uh, developing technologies for biomedical research. And it's from that that we laid the foundation for what became Epcelera. Founded the company in 2012, uh, sort of double timed for a while, both in academia and leading the company. And eventually, you know, was so excited by the opportunity and the challenge of building an antibody company that I stepped away from that completely. Um, so that that is my last uh, 20 years in about two minutes. I'm happy to happy to elaborate if needed. Wow, is the simple answer to that, Carl. Well, um, so passion indeed, living, breathing, sleeping, eating bioscience and technology, which brings us around to what we're going to be discussing today. So now the first antibody therapy was approved in 1986. And since then, the market has grown from nothing to a value of $200 billion as of 2022. And it is expected to more than double in the next five years. So can you tell us about the innovation that this momentum has attracted and the new modalities of antibodies that are being enabled now? Yeah, um, I, I think it's, it's uh, you know, antibodies over the last, uh, I suppose it's over 30 years now, maybe 35 years, have been quite a remarkable story. And I think it's a good example of how um, in this field in drug development, there, there's really two ways in which you move the needle and make a difference for patients. And one of them, of course, is uh, to get some fundamental insight into biology. Uh, that is the, you know, that's the domain of all academic research and, and the private sector, uh, the genome project. So I think as, a, as an ecosystem, uh, we are making steady progress. We all wish it would be faster. 
the other way that you make really big gains is when you uh, change the tools and technology that let you prosecute those ideas. And what you mentioned there, you know, antibodies, the first approved in the 80s, I view that very much as a, as a triumph of technology entrepreneurs that at the time were trying to put together the tools and processes to go from the paradigm that was small molecules into uh, using antibodies as a new mo modality. It's easy to forget, but at the time, there was a lot of skepticism on that. So the larger companies uh, and many others didn't believe that you would be able to make a large complex molecule into an actual drug. Um, and you know, in, 80, in the 80s, there was a first approval. Really, it wasn't until the 2000s uh, that you started to see some of the, uh, what are today the iconic biotechnology companies that had that capability and started to really prosecute some of the easier targets. And that led to a string of approvals that was the start of that, of that growth. So fast forward to today, what has that meant? I think there's, you know, starting from zero, there's maybe a hundred plus approved antibody therapies. As you mentioned, that market has seen roughly 11% compounded annual growth over 30 years and, uh, you know, is projected, uh, though, of course, you know, looking in the future always has some big error bars, but it's projected to at least keep pace, if not accelerate. And that is being driven, I'd say, by, by two big factors, uh, or maybe perhaps three. So one has been the, the remarkable success of antibodies that, are, uh, that is pinned on the science that has some fundamental advantages over small molecules, most specifically that they are exquisitely specific, uh, meaning that they can you know, recognize a target and have uh, very low off-target effects, uh, something that small molecules um, often have trouble with. Uh, they have a very long half-life, so good PK, uh, and antibodies have been evolved over you know, 500 million years to engage with the immune system and allow for a variety of different you know, mechanisms for clearing a disease target. Uh, so in the, la like the success over, I'd say the 2000s, attracted a lot more people into the sector, and so you saw antibodies being used much more broadly. Today we have uh, programs you know, that Upseller has worked on and programs in the industry that touch areas like uh, metabolism, uh, neuroscience, um, cardiovascular disease, oncology, and beyond. Uh, the other thing that's happened that's really driving it, and this is maybe the last part of your question there, is that antibodies um, are not a, a one-trick pony. So over the last 10 years, you've seen what I like to call the, the Cambrian explosion of different antibody modalities, where the very specific properties of antibody binding along with the ability to do what is increasingly powerful protein engineering, lets you uh, plug and play antibodies into different modalities. And so some of the ones that are really coming up now, of course, bispecifics, which let you bind more than one target. Uh, antibody drug conjugates getting a lot of attention, uh, radioisotope conjugates, uh, antibodies even have a very, a very important role in uh, new modalities like cell therapy. And so you know, going forward, what's really driving it is improved antibody modalities, being able to go after more difficult targets, something that we are definitely focused on, and the increasingly uh, diverse and in many cases very effective way of using antibodies in new therapeutic formats. Thank you, Zach Carl. So can we just sort of go a little bit deeper there? So we, we sort of segued from talking about the, the first antibody therapies, which were monoclonal. Sure to the more complicated antibody modalities you were mentioning last. Can you just let listeners know a little bit more about those latter ones potential and the possible challenges also? Uh, yeah, um, perhaps I'll, I'll start with uh, bispecific, which is mm -hmm. a, you know, uh, one of the fields that we've been working in uh, over the last few years. Um, so a normal antibody, of course, is a monoclonal uh, in the conventional format. It has an FC region, and then two arms. Uh, both arms typically bind the same target. For some time now, uh, you know, for well over a decade, uh, people have been exploring the use of antibodies that are engineered to not bind a single target, but rather to bind two targets. So you have an antibody uh, that in the simplest format is still a Y, but each arm has a different specificity. One of the, I'd say, most exciting and certainly one of the areas getting the most attention in bispecifics is the use of that modality or the use of bispecifics to recruit uh, or to, to bring cells together and to promote the clearance of, let's say, cancer cells by simultaneous recruitment and activation 
of T cells. Um, so there are now hundreds of trials investigating this, and there have been some remarkable successes over the last few years, uh, particularly in the area of blood cancers. That's a uh, a way to you know harness, recruit, and direct a patient's own immune system against uh, a cancer cell uh, or cancer cells, and has the potential to uh, really transform immunotherapy. Just today, in fact, I, I saw you know a new uh, some data that was released on uh, using CAR Ts, which are engineered T cells, uh, to fight a variety of different autoimmune conditions. So anti CD19 CAR Ts. Uh, there's also examples of CAR Ts being used uh, to fight cancer. Our view is that anywhere that an engineered T cell can have a positive effect in a patient, uh, there is a strong possibility of being able to come in and use a bispecific antibody to replace that. And the advantage of that, of course, is that while cell therapies have had a lot of attention and have been you know, incredibly, I think, innovative and in many cases, effective therapies, they have faced uh, quite formidable challenges in manufacturing on the business side, whereas an antibody is a format that can be delivered like a drug, there's a supply chain, uh, and that has the potential to bring those discoveries that are made in CAR-T to a much broader uh, patient population and do it in a way that is easier to build a business around, which of course amplifies the impact and success. So let's focus on businesses themselves now. So the technology's there, but how does the usage of that technology and the experience of using it differ between a startup and say a larger company, one of these iconic biotechs you mentioned previously? Well, that's a big question. Um, it is a big question. It's a big question. <laughs> Maybe I'll try to reframe that question, make sure I'm uh, I'm taking it uh, head on here. So the question could be uh, could be framed as, um, hey, uh, it's wonderful that there is a variety of different innovations that are happening. But what is the role that a small company has uh, and the challenges versus one of the larger, more established companies? And is that is that roughly what what you're getting at? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So. It's a it's a big question. Um, maybe I'll start by by highlighting what uh, those two types of organizations you know traditionally have done for the sector and the industry because I think there is a lot of synergy uh, between the two. So in, instead of framing the challenges or putting that as two two subsectors that are in, in antagonism, I think it's more more properly viewed as a synergistic relationship. Um, so the first thing is if you looked at the number of new antibody therapies that have been approved over the last, let's say, 10 years or so uh, by large companies. And uh, someone's going to have to fact check this because I haven't looked at the, the numbers recently. But my, my recollection is that roughly two thirds of the innovative new therapies were initiated from smaller companies. So that's, uh, that's a signal that you know, there have been many, many more small companies and small companies by definition, have a tight focus on a particular area uh, and are able to explore a wide variety of you know, different modalities that um, in, many, in many cases, but certainly not the majority of cases, end up being good ideas that make a difference. Um, if you're a small company, uh, you, you typically cannot compete by doing what the larger, more established companies are able to do. And so there is I think a healthy and strong bias in small companies to take more risk and to go after first-in-class therapies or new targets that can really move the needle. That's a, a double-edged sword. So when you succeed, you've created value. Uh, it also means that the vast majority of those are not going to succeed. And if you look at small companies, you know the failure rate is exceptionally high, and that's part of having a healthy ecosystem. Now, the, the flip side of it is that that once a therapy begins to work, uh, particularly in some indications, it needs to go into a much broader, more expensive, and more difficult stage of development. So you know, manufacturing, of course, is part of that, but then the large clinical trials and ultimately the commercial sales. That type of activity tends to be very much you know, a big company game. And so many times, small companies get to the point where they've got a single therapy, they have proved it out, and it makes more sense economically, both for the company and for the larger player, to hand that therapy over. Um, and so most small companies are on a trajectory that in the best case ends up uh, being either an acquisition or an out licensing to a large company. Um, so it's a healthy thing for the ecosystem. It has given rise to many uh, very good drugs, 
it also means that it's exceptionally hard to start from scratch and to build a company that scales to be, let's say, a $20 billion plus company. In fact, we had a look at this recently. And um, I think, you know, there's maybe a handful, maybe five biopharma companies that have reached that benchmark that were founded in the last 20 or 25 years. So that's globally. So a very, very hard thing to do. I'll maybe just, uh, I'll maybe pause there or, or just add one more comment that it is also important to look at, you know, firm by firm, because there are some companies, small companies that are setting themselves up in a way that uh, has a real potential to scale. And those companies have built broad platforms and have taken, you know, business models that don't bet the farm on a single asset early on. You know, we, we have definitely, you know, done our, done our level best. Uh, to make sure we're setting up seller up that way. And I believe that we've done a great job getting there. And on the flip side, there are many large companies that are highly innovative and that have built the majority of their pipeline from internal work. Um, those tend to be the majority, but you know, companies that stand out would be companies like Eli Lilly and companies like Regeneron, you know, two of our partners where if you look at their, their portfolio, most of that has come from internal work. So it's always dangerous to paint you know, these, these groups of the broad brush, you really have to look at the idiosyncrasies of the, um, of the different firms and the platforms. Thank you. So you've sort of preempted my question there. I was about I'm to glad. ask, what role does Abcelera play in this landscape? So thinking about the, the exceptionally hard yet healthy ecosystem that exists and this key point of the potentiality for scaling. Yeah, so I think Epsilon is a very uh, unusual story, uh, you know, perhaps perhaps almost unique. So coming back to something I said earlier, um, I made the point that if you want to make a difference in this industry, or maybe to frame it, if you want to build a successful company, when, when capital markets work well, and, you know, most times in the long run, at least they do, uh, what you need to do is deliver real value to patients. So you need to move the needle in making drugs. There's two ways to do that. Again, one is to have a unique insight into the biology, uh, I call that secrets. So if you have a if you have a secret about a target or about an indication, you know that is a way in which you can, you know, with normal technologies without a lot of differentiation on the technical side, make a big difference. The other way is to go after uh, the known biology, so the big opportunities that are out in the open, uh, but that have been difficult to prosecute uh, mostly for technical reasons. So an example would be, you know, target classes where everyone knows that an antibody against a target that did, that had a certain function, let's say it was a, an anti-ion channel antibody that was a strong antagonist of the ion channel. And everyone knows and has known for 20 years that that would be a blockbuster drug, but there are no such drugs. And the reason is not anything to do with the science, it's to do with the technology not being able to deliver the molecules that you want uh, to have that effect. Okay, so the, there, are, there are areas where uh, the science is public, but the barrier has been technological. Um, we started our company with the idea that that is what we were going to pursue. Um, so 11 years ago, in 2012, we decided that we were going to lead our strategy by investing in uh, technologies and in people and in infrastructure in order to be able to solve the really difficult discovery challenges in antibody therapies. I thought that was a wonderful idea. Uh, there wasn't a single investor that agreed with me. Um, and I, I, th I think probably for good reasons. And the reason is that it has proven to be an extremely long and expensive road to build the capabilities to go from an idea through to a drug. We, it, uh, it's one of those cases where if you knew how hard it was, you probably wouldn't have started. But we have, you know, through a combination of business model, uh, you know, hard work, diligence, some good bounces along the way, we've managed to put the company in the position where we believe we now have a highly differentiated, I would say best in industry capabilities to go from ideas to drug targets. One of the key things in doing that, you asked about our role in the sector. So one of the key ideas to doing that was that if you were going to make that investment, you were looking at over a decade and maybe over $500 million to get there. You needed to be using that technology a lot, both to warrant the investment and in order to make sure you're working on the real problems and you're getting experience in doing drug development. Uh, so both of those things uh, we were able to achieve by focusing a lot on partnerships early on. So in the early days of the company, we were uh, completely focused not on developing our own therapies, but rather on connecting with 
innovators across the ecosystem and providing to them technology that could help them get over a barrier and closer to a value inflection point. Uh, so through that, you know, starting in 2015 till today, I think we've worked on over 100 different antibody therapeutic programs and built a model where by doing that work, we were getting paid up front. We were getting experience on working on hard problems and we were keeping a stake in the ultimate success of those programs, uh, typically through um, milestones and royalties. So, a, a, you know, a low to mid to mid single digit royalty position on the successful approval of a drug. That uh, that was the start of the business. Uh, over time, uh, particularly post IPO, as we've started to complete our capabilities, uh, have more capital and more scale, we've started to evolve that uh, that strategy or reveal it. Uh, the first step in that is doing programs where there's co-development. So we have partnered with a variety of different companies where um, we start with a 50-50 ownership in the molecule and have the ability to invest further to bring that forward. And on top of that, you know, five years ago, began work internally uh, to solve some really difficult therapeutic discovery problems and start to build an internal pipeline of programs. Um, so, you know, starting in 2012, that was always on the radar. It takes time to have the capabilities to solve the problems, to advance the programs. Uh, and we're actually at a pretty interesting point right now in the business where much of the build, not all of it, has been complete. What, is, what still remains is, uh, you know, over the next two years, we're putting in place the manufacturing capability. We have a robust and large portfolio of partnerships. We have co-development deals uh, that are starting to move forward. And last quarter, we announced our first two internal programs that we're taking into IED enabling studies, uh, so into manufacturing, and that will be uh, hitting the clinic in 2025. Um, so all of that, you know, is part of a broader strategy, which is where we started the company, which is invest, take a long-term view in being able to solve problems that really make a difference for medicines, and use that capability to build a large and diversified stake in therapeutic molecules, and that stake includes, uh, you know, small pieces of many that are being developed by other partners. It includes co-development, and increasingly includes internal programs, which is, you know, one of the areas of main focus moving forward. Thank you for that, Carl. That is quite a journey. So, and an evolution too of more than a journey. So, if we're we're thinking about this future looking. You mentioned there that Abcellar itself is sort of looking towards that 2025 mark. If we if we come out broadly again to the sector in which Abcellar works, what's that future landscape look? Do you have any sort of predictions for a decade, say two decades, or a hope? You know, we're at that time of year where hopes are plenty and predictions are many too. Great question. Another big question. I I I'm, I'm afraid I might misattribute the quote, but I think someone said it might have been Niels Bohr that. Uh, that uh, prediction is difficult, particularly when it's about the future. So with that caveat, um, look, in, in the near term, you know, one of the obvious, I, I think there, there's two uh, you know, opposing and countervailing forces right now in the near term. So you have unprecedented levels of basic science and innovation. If you looked at, our, if you looked at biotech broadly, like not just antibodies, and antibodies are, I think, probably the most exciting part of this, but look at it broadly the amount of new innovation and modalities and tools that are being brought to developing new drugs is at a high watermark and appears to be getting better all the time. Uh, so I, I think just recently we had an approval of the first, first gene therapy, CRISPR-based uh, gene therapy. You know, antibodies are accelerating uh, immuno-oncology, uh, RNA therapeutics. Um, it is an astounding amount, amount of science and innovation that is sort of reaching a boiling point. On the, on the flip side, we're currently in what has been one of the most difficult, probably the deepest, and uh, we hope will not be the longest, uh, bear markets in biotech that you've seen in a long time. So you know, many companies out there, whether you're public or private, over the last two or three years, there's been a dramatic shift in the availability of capital, uh, and that really has a chilling effect on innovation. Um, so what you're going to see is you know, people are starting, starting fewer companies. They're doubling down on the things they already have. That's going to that's gonna create you know, some, some headwinds for innovation in the near term. It's been said, and it's probably true, that there's, there's probably also a positive view on that. You get a, you get a culling of some of the companies that perhaps you know, were not on the right path, uh, and the companies that are making progress will emerge from this stronger. Uh, and if you're building a company, if you're a good capital position, which we are 
then the thing to do is to make sure you're investing your money where it makes sense and the tide will turn and when it does, you'll be in an even better position. So uh, long term, uh, I, I think there's every reason to believe that this is going to be one of the big growth sectors in the economy. Uh, the innovation is there and obviously the medical need is there. In the near term, I think it's time to it's time to batten down the hatches and make sure that you're you're preserving capital and doing what's really moving the needle to make sure that your company stays strong. And that's what we've been doing over the last little while. The sort of biotech Darwinism, it seems, is unfolding. Thank you for that. <laughs> I think you know, biotech, uh, I, maybe it's Darwinism uh, writ large, because I think it's it's also hitting some other sectors as well. Of course, biotech is particularly vulnerable, vulnerable given that um, we, we work in this pathological industry where you do great work, you find great innovation, you have great ideas, and you invest for a very long time uh, before that ultimately becomes a therapy and makes a difference in the market. And that, that's because of clinical testing in the regulatory environment. So uh, when markets turn bearish, people tend to have, have very short time horizons. And uh, biotech is an industry where it doesn't happen quarter to quarter, it happens over years. Uh, and so I think, uh, particularly hard in biotech, but it's, it's uh, not easy times in a lot of other sectors as well. So I, I, I don't think biotech has a monopoly on, uh, on the Darwinism. Thank Survival you, of the fittest, though, is, is, is a, good, uh, a good principle. A very good principle. It's been a pleasure. Uh, likewise. Uh, thanks so much, Nicole. And so that concludes another episode of the Pharma Forum podcast. You can find out more information about this episode, including a download link and information about previous installments of the series at pharmaforum.com forward slash podcasts. The Pharma Forum podcast is also available on iTunes, Spotify, Acast, Stitcher and Podbean, where you can find and subscribe by searching the Pharma Forum. Of course, don't forget to visit our website itself, where you can sign up for daily news and analysis bulletins, and follow us on Twitter, or X nowadays, at at PharmaForum. That's all for now. Thank you for listening.